So, <clears throat> we're about to start. Welcome back, everybody. Who's here for the first time? Yay. Why did you guys come here? <laughs> That's basically the question I get all the time from everyone. So I just want to hear some answers. Um, for those who raise your hands, can you please sort of elaborate a bit? <laughs> Do you guys work with AI? I, I need some, some answers. Please shout them out. I heard something. Okay, so who's here, um, who's here who works with AI on their daily basis? Just gonna do okay. Two people, three, four, five. Um, who uses AI at least once a week, or machine learning methods, or other things? Okay. And who has never done anything related to machine learning whatsoever? Don't be shy. It's good. It's fine. So one person. So who's everyone else? <laughs> so, well, hopefully. Um, it doesn't matter who you are, hopefully you'll enjoy today because we'll have some great talks. So for those who haven't been here, um, this is an artificial intelligence group meetup. We try to keep this an open AI society that uh, everyone is welcome to contribute to. Uh, you're welcome to come and help me organize this <laughs> or run it instead of me, which I would appreciate actually. <laughs> um, what we, so yeah, that's me. Um, and what we do here is we gather an AI community together. We deliver presentations and paper reviews. We have never done paper reviews yet because we have quite a few speakers who want to talk. So that's great. And we also promote AI to the general public. So this is sort of our mission statement and we try to live by it. So today, uh, we're going to have three wonderful speakers. So we're going to have Lucas Lopez here, who's going to tell us more about insect-based artificial stuff mobile robots. So I, I, th I think that's just going to be really scary. I mean, when you read something like that, it's, it's de definitely those worst case scenarios that take over and uh, do things, right? So we'll, we'll start in a sec, but um, the second speaker is going to be Rokas. Rokas, where are you? Here. Here. Uh, he's going to talk about chatting with computers instead of people, which is always fun. <laughs> and, then, um, and then we're going to have Vladimir who's going to talk about behavioral prediction and predicting um, predicting why would people take a photo like that, you know, just things like that, <laughs> you know, predicting behaviors. Um, thanks for, thanks Exacaster for sponsoring this event. We, we have sponsors every week and this week your pizzas and drinks are brought by Exacaster, so thanks for that. They work in the AI space and I guess you can tell more about that. Um, thank you, Rise, for... for <laughs> letting us use this venue, which is great actually, because when I was looking for bigger venues, trying to fit more people, most of them are really, really sad. So I think we'll try and keep it running here as long as we can. Maybe in the summer we can do it outside for once, but uh, we'll see. Um, yeah, the music is still on. That's, I know you're saying that. Okay, I'll turn it off. Or do you guys want the music on? Because, I mean, it's great. Um, yeah, so thank you, Rise, for sponsoring this event and helping us uh, do it here. And we also have great streaming equipment here, so that's that's easy. That's that's good for those who can't make it and want to watch it at home. So if you want to become a sponsor as a company, please do. These are all the sponsors we had, and we have a list of them in the, in the, for the following events. But we always are happy if somebody wants to feed this crowd, which supposedly consists of 10% who done AI in their lifetimes. <laughs> And then um, the next meetup is going to be at around 25th of April, probably on the 25th, but we'll confirm it as, as, we, as we book a place here. And again, we'll try to have three wonderful speakers. And before, just before I go, I want to ask everyone to join AI Lithuania group for discussions about AI in Lithuania, and also artificial intelligence group, which is basically like an archive of previous events that are happening here, you can watch all the talks and read the comments, um, which are usually great <laughs> about it. And then also, one thing before I forgot, do we have Idis here who asked me to talk about this? I really hope he's here. Anyway, if he's not here, I'll do my best describing what this is. So for those who code in Python or like in artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's gonna be a conference in Konus. Yay, 
on the 5th of May, and there will be workshops and uh, talks about using machine learning and, and data science and using Python and using other languages. So for those who want to you know, do this, this sort of thing, please check it out, PyCon LT, that's a part of a bigger PyCon conference. And, and, and I'll, post it, uh, I'll post stuff about it on the group and you can find more about it. So thanks, and without further ado, let's start the first talk. So, so Lucas is a part of Rise. I, I sometimes sit here and he does too. And I was trying to convince him to speak here for a few months now. <laughs> so um, I guess he can tell more about what he does with AI on a daily basis and more about these robots. To remove this stuff? <laughs> okay, that's right. What do you want? Uh, just a regular presentation. Okay. Oh, I don't know. No, this is an extended view, so you're, you're going to basically... Okay, okay, okay. We'll see you next slide. Okay, yeah. Um, hello, my name is Lucas Lopez. I am, I'm a member in, in RISE here in Vilnius. Uh, I'm living in Lithuania for two years already. Um, I'm originally from Spain, and I'm the founder of Ex Machina. And, uh, well, uh, currently what I'm working at is uh, helping uh, companies, basically uh, online marketing agencies and um, uh, e-commerces. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, to, to know a little bit more about their data, their customers, and uh, predicting behavior, um, segmentation of uh, customers, product, these kind of things. It's something I really like, but I'm not here today to talk about this. I'm going to talk about um, something I did in, in the past. Uh, so some years ago, I had the chance to work in, in research in a neuroscience uh, lab. Uh, this is a small overview of the of the lab I was working at. Uh, it's called Specs. It's well, a acronym for all that. And um, well, it was something I really loved. But um, well, let's say for pragmatical reasons, I needed to change it. How many of you people is is working in research here at the university um, postdoc? Okay, I really admire you. You are like raise your hand, Tom. <laughs> you are really um, motivated by by passion. Passion. <laughs> Rather than money, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a tough world. I mean, the state of research is not, not the, the best it could be, at least. So this is just an overview of the lab of kind of things they, they were doing. This is the XIM. This is a, a room they were using to, to study the behavior of people. So they would uh, ask them to play games and um, basically analyze how would they cooperate or have a selfish behavior, depending on, on conditions. Uh, this on top here, on top right, is a um, hybrid uh, circuit. So it has uh, some uh, neurons of a rat on, on it, and it's uh, used to, to drive a robot, a little robot. You've probably seen something similar on, on the internet. And well, maybe this one is also interesting. This is the rehabilitation gaming system. Um, it's based on mirror neurons. Uh, how many of you know the, the concept of mirror neurons? Okay, so basically, for those of you who don't, it's uh, a group of neurons in your brain which is uh, recreating uh, whatever uh, sensory input that it gets. When, when, for instance, you see me here talking in the, in the stage, uh, the mirror neurons uh, simulate yourself talking in the stage in, in my shoes. So it has a, a big role in, in empathy and um, in many other things. And they discovered that um, uh, patients in, who had a stroke and, or basically a, a, an ictus in, in their brain, um, they were able to recover this mobility in, in, in a lost member uh, much quicker if they were able to, if they were playing this game in which uh, their movements, the movements of the, the arm they could move, for instance, were amplified. That's pretty amazing topic. But um, yeah, the topic, I'm, my topic, it's uh, artificial function. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and um, 
this is what I was doing in the lab, and uh, I work inside the NeuroChem project. NeuroChem project is, um, well, it was a big project financed by the European Union. Um, many universities were working there, and we were collaborating. And uh, basically, the aim was uh, to to mimic the neural pathways of uh, uh, living beings, basic, uh, mainly insects and mammals, and recreate them in, in robots or artificial noses in order to, to be able to classify or find uh, sources of others. And uh, that's what I was doing there. I was working in an autonomous mobile robot, which means that it only uses uh, input from the sensors it has. It, it has no other information from GPS or location, it doesn't know where it is, it will just uh, navigate autonomically. And, um, and this robot uh, was supposed to find um, other sources, classify them in, in a wind tunnel, and uh, find the source of the other, basically. So just some applications of, of this, uh, human mining, like uh, when, when there are these um, natural catastrophes, um, earthquakes, whatever, you, you need to, to find people under the rocks. They are using dogs for that because they can smell people, but this uh, can potentially also be an application of artificial olfaction. Um, explosive detection, food quality control, if you want to know how fresh your meat is or what kind of coffee you are buying, well, that's, that's there. Uh, health issues, you've maybe seen in, on TV that they are uh, training dogs to detect uh, whether a patient has uh, some kind of lung cancer or stomach cancer uh, using their breath. So they are smelling the breath and they are able to detect uh, uh, any, any issues they could have. Um, well, that's pretty useful. And uh, drug localization, yeah, well, whether you want to ban them or use them, it's always good to know where they are, yeah? <laughs> And, uh, well, initially you could think, okay, what's the deal with artificial faction, right? I take chemical sensors, I read the signal, and then I basically, um, well, give a, a, a classification based on the value. But it's not as simple as that, because these sensors, as well as, as the neurons in, in the brain that are responsive, uh, responsible for, for this task, they, they are very different from, from they, they are giving a signal very different from the one you would get or, uh, from, um, from a microphone or, or a video camera. First of all, uh, well, sensor status that does not reflect uh, the instant readings. That means that uh, what they are going to give you is a time signal. So you will need to analyze how the signal changes over time in order to be able to classify properly. Uh, there is a strong coupling. I mean, you don't have a sensor for a specific uh, chemical and another for, for another. Of course, uh, there are some sensors that react more to, to some chemicals and, and so on and so far, but still, all of them will react in, in a different way, and you need to combine the signals from all of them to be able to classify. Um, they have a very strong memory effect, meaning that uh, if you uh, got a signal for ethanol, for instance, and a few moments later, uh, you get a signal from ammonia, you will still have the, the reading for ethanol on, on your back and, and will need to, to work that out. They get um, saturated very, very easily, so if a lot of odor is rise to the sensor, it will get collapsed and basically the reading will be a lot of smell, but I don't know what it is. And uh, they are very noisy and especially sensitive to airflow. And uh, that's very critical to a robot because if you have an artificial nose under control conditions and, well, you have a machine, you are putting the component there and uh, you give some smell, then, yeah, it's fine. You, you can more or less control. But if you are uh, using sensors in, in a robot and the robot is moving, um, well, basically you could smell a lot of things, right? And even the movements of the robot are going to, to condition how the sensors are reacting. That means that uh, it's, it's some kind of couple thing. This is a, a mock sensor. This is the kind of sensors we were uh, using. They are from a company in Japan. And this is, well, this is more or less the signal you would get. This is a very stable signal already. But uh, you can see here that uh, they take some time until the signal um, reacts when, when the odor is released. Then there are a lot of peaks here, which, uh, well, just keep them in mind because they will be very interesting in, in a few slides. And, they also have a very slow reaction when the other disappears. So why, why uh, biomimetic olfaction? Well, 
when we started this project, uh, there were some applications, and you can see this, this device here is a typical electronic nose device. And uh, what they are doing is giving the, the, the gas readings, to the, uh, well, the gas uh, samples to the machine. They will wait for a few seconds for the sensors to stabilize, and nothing else needs to, needs to get in there. And they, um, they are using these typical classification techniques to, to, to classify others, um, well, key nearest neighbors, uh, LDA, even some um, well, typical uh, multi-layer perceptrons to classify others. But this has very well, a lot of disadvantages, basically, because um, you need not a time signal. For those, you need the static readings, right? if you are familiar with these models. So um, why, why, why we would uh, put our attention in, in insects? Well, they, are have a, they, they have a, a great performance compared to machines, at least uh, right now. Uh, they, are very, they have a very, very simple brain. And um, well, with 200k neurons, they are able to classify odors in a very turbulent environment and um, very quickly. They don't need a lot of... Uh, samples. And well, when, when we saw these models, uh, what we saw is that, uh, well, research so far had been done with, um, with simulated data. Oh, thank you very much. Does anyone else want some water? <laughs> okay. Really needed it. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, the, uh, these models were uh, created with simulated, uh, in simulated environments and at the same time we simulated data from, from sensors. So we saw a chance, a very interesting chance there to, to implement something. And uh, well, first of all, what we pay attention to is the, the behavior of the moth. Since we are going to implement this in a, in a, in a robot, um, the robot is going to move, and it's not only about the, the model that is going to classify the others, but uh, how the robot is going to behave in the wind tunnel, right? So what the moths do, it's, well, all our research was based on, on, on the moth. Um, when they are mating, uh, the, the female moth release some pheromones to the earth, and uh, wind will take these, these pheromones far away, and then the male moth, uh, once they, the, they see a, well, a, a little track of other pheromones from the male, they will search, which uh, basically means uh, going against the wind. So they take this direction against the wind. And if at some point they lose the track, they will start this casting movement. This casting movement is basically a zigzag that begins very slowly. And well, if they don't find it, it, it gets uh, wider and wider until they, they find the track, hopefully. And if they do, they search again. It's a very simple behavior. But, uh, well, it works pretty well. Uh, that's about the, the behavior. And then the olfactory pathway of, of insects. And uh, well, just uh, an overall, you can see three main parts here. You have the, the antenna, you know, antenna of insects. And it's full of these ORNs, olfactory receptor neurons. And there are different kinds of ORNs. So each of them is uh, specialized in a specific kind of pheromone, odor, chemical, whatever. And uh, all those um, ORNs will go to, to this glomeruli. Glomeruli basically uh, concentrate the signal from, from ORNs. This is the antenna lobe. The antenna lobe is a little ball at the base of the antenna. And um, is this working? OK. <laughs> So um, it's concentrating the signals from similar ORNs here. And then you have this network here. Uh, the, uh, red here is uh, excitatory connections. Blue here is inhibitory connections. And well, it was not clear what the function was. But if you have a look at the projection neurons, which are directly fed by the glomeruli, you will see a very different signal from what the ORNs are giving. And that was very interesting, and that's what uh, we base our model on here. So this is, would be some kind of signal preprocessing. And then you have the mushroom body. The mushroom body oh, was kind of a big mass of uh, interconnected neurons in a very mysterious way, at least. So nobody has 
it's very clear what, what the function, well, the function, function is classifying the other. So basically, after this processing, uh, pre-processing, mushroom body will take this information and classify the other from, uh, from there. But uh, how this works was not, not really uh, clear. So, so how did you guys map this whole thing out about the moth? Or is this a common We knowledge? didn't map it directly, but we used studies from uh, different universities. Uh, one of them, for instance, this is going to show the, how these projection neurons behave in comparison to the antenna lobe. I, sorry, to the, to the ORNs. And what you're seeing here is the real excitation of uh, the projection neurons of a moth. So this was a guy, Nussel, who made his PhD in the ETH in Switzerland, and he connected an fMRI to, to the moth and measured the activity of the PNs, right? How big is a fMRI machine for the moths? <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I, I don't want to know. <laughs> well, but uh, he got these very nice videos, and what he found out, found, found out is that um, well, you see that they are having a very different signal from the chemical sensors or ORNs. So they are, most of the times, they will be inactive if there is no interesting odor there. And once the, the, the odor appears, they will spike. They will have this kind of alpha function, as he said, which has this duration, baseline, and amplitude. And uh, uh, well, he, 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 he made his PhD on base, based on this model, and this was very interesting because if you remember the signal the, the orange were giving was something like that, uh, very constant, there was always something there, a lot of noise, a lot of signals, difficult to classify, really difficult even to know if there was another there. And, um, well, if we were mana if we managed to to transform this signal into something similar to the PNs, uh, then we thought, well, maybe we can use this information to classify the other. And it turns out we we modeled something similar to what we think the antenna lobe is doing in the insect. And well, you can see these three status uh, machine chain, call it whatever. So it's, it's based on, on that the signal is, will have a baseline, which can be varying a long time, but should be more or less constant, slow one. Then there will be a sudden rise on the, on the signal because uh, there was an airflow or a plume that it was suddenly detected. And then uh, it will be this decay, and then it will return to the baseline. So basically, we wanted to recreate this function. And the model we did for this was this. This is a very simplified uh, version of it, but more or less you can get the idea. So basically you have the ORNs on top that uh, get concentrated in the glomerulus. So this is trying to mimic what the moth had, but in the simulation, right? Yeah, okay. this is the model for the antenna lobe. If you remember a couple of slides ago we had here. And uh, this is the model for this. This is the antenna lobe, which is the signal preprocessing. And basically, it's concentrating the, the, all the ORNs, the, all the signals from the sensors in the glomerulus, and then directly feeding the projection neuron. The projection neuron is, is, is going to be the one that will be used for classification later. But based on the connections that we saw on the, on the antenna lobe of the insect, we created this uh, local neurons uh, groups. You can see this homogeneous local neuron and this uh, heterogeneous local neuron there who has, that has uh, inhibitory connections, which are the blue ones. And basically the, the functioning of this is all the glomerulus feed these homogeneous local neurons, which are um, having a, a slow inhibitory effect on the heterogeneous local neurons. And um, this is in, in, in the antenna lobe, this is actually done with the uh, GABA uh, B um, receptors. And uh, then you have a, a quick, uh, fast inhibitory uh, connection to the projection neuron, uh, which is a GABA A uh, receptor. So basically, what you are achieving with this is um, you are removing the baseline from the signal using the, the homogeneous local neuron and you are using the heterogeneous local neuron to filter when actually um, the signal has some of these little peaks that you saw before in the, in the sensor signal. So 
this, this would be recreated with what is called a spiking neural network, which um, basically, well, the difference is nowadays if you are using TensorFlow or Keras and you know, of these libraries, you know that you have your model and you give an input and what you get is an instantaneous output, right? So for each input, you get an output. In a spike neural network, uh, neurons are actually not only depending on inputs, but they depend on time. So they have an internal status and you can have uh, more complex models there. They are running all the time. And um, what you can achieve with these uh, delayed connections are uh, calculating derivatives normally because um, well, basically, if you feed a neuron, you excite a neuron uh, directly with a connection in T, but you subtract what was uh, T minus whatever time, then you get the, the change of the function, right? So you have the derivative. And, um, well, that's, that's what you were doing. Basically, the heterogeneous local neuron was uh, seeking for these small peaks, and the homogeneous local neuron was uh, watching there for the baseline. And uh, yeah, well, we, we managed to get sim signals similar to this, and well, by the naked eye, you, you can already see that there was this difference in, in, in the signals given for ethanol and ammonia, which were the two components that we were using. Uh, maybe because we couldn't find any other thing that small, the smell uh, worse. <laughs> and um, well, basically, that was the model for the antenna lobe. We were happy for, for this. And then we had this other model for the mushroom body, which was this big mass of interconnected neurons that uh, well, was not very clear what we were doing. But we speculated, of course we don't know, but we speculated that it would behave like a liquid state machine. Um, how many of you know a liquid state machine? Okay, one, <laughs> yeah, it's not a very popular model. So it's a spike in neural network that Basically, its objective is to, to create a static spatial, spatial representation of a time-varying signal. So in the, in the projection neurons, we had these alpha waves, if you remember. And if we want to classify this, of course, well, nowadays, probably go for a convolutional neural network, something like this. But uh, this model has a kind of advantage, and is that training is very simple. You only need to put a classifier on, on, on top of it and, and you get the classification. So how does this work more or less? It's very simple. You have uh, this main uh, block in the middle which is called the liquid. Liquid is, uh, is a mass of neurons which is uh, randomly interconnected. How you connect them, frequency and weights is, is a bit more complex story. But uh, it's basically a trial and error <laughs> process. So it's relatively simple, and uh, sorry. And um, the thing is that because you are feeding uh, this time varying signal to the liquid, uh, this this liquid will constantly be feeding each other, and it will uh, perform a specific shape for a specific uh, time signal in the input, giving this uh, static uh, output maybe this great philosopher is able to explain a little bit. This is what it is, okay? Oh, no. I said empty so your mind. Yes, it's Be formless, shapeless, <laughs> like water. Um, now, you okay. put water into a I cup. I guess we can skip it. It becomes... Okay. So, basically, be water, my friend. Water is uh, flexible, it can adapt to whatever. So the idea is you have this liquid there that is going to change its states uh, based on the order and time uh, you send things. So you can imagine a, a, a deposit with water, you are throwing stones there, and it really depends on where you throw stones and at what time the liquid, if you take a photograph at a specific time after you throw them all, we have a specific configuration of waves, right? So using that pattern, you can, uh, after that, uh, pass it to a classifier, traditional, simple classifier, and then classify whatever you got there. And why well, it turned out to, to work there, our, um, basically we had two questions here. Uh, first one, if we were able to, to use this model to classify in, on, a, on an autonomous robot, that was the most basic thing. And then the second, the second is, um, if the behavior of the robot was actually affecting how the classifier was working, which is something interesting because of this dualism that was uh, thought like brain-body dualism before.
experiment setup. Well, you can see the robot here. First thing you will see is that it's not so sophisticated. <laughs> Very basic one. In the last years, uh, maker community have made a lot, a lot of improvements in, in, on this sense, but well, we, we had to work with, with this. Had a very big batteries and an embedded computer. But interesting things here, this is the sensor, the array of sensors for, for chemo sensors. And the rest is just, uh, well, some, some ultrasonic sensors for avoid co uh, collidance and some, uh, well, uh, wind direction detection. Uh, we had this wind tunnel here, so we would put the smell at the beginning of the tunnel. We had some fans here, and they would take air, and we would place the robot here at the beginning of the tunnel, and it would actually move. You can see the, the robot there moving. So this would simulate the moths and how they... Uh, yeah, and yeah, this kind of robot would be the moth, if you want to call it. And uh, you have the, the, the wind tunnel there, which would be the, the environment uh, being those colorful things there, they are the smells in, in water, so they are releasing these, these components to the air. And then the robot is, is trying to find the whatever component that uh, we specified. And well, we made experiment in, in, well, we made four kind of experiments. First of all, we wanted to see the performance of the classifier. For that, we put uh, only one odor in the wind tunnel. So we were able to detect true positives and uh, false positives for uh, both components that we were using, basically ethanol and ammonia. And then at the same time, we were doing this uh, for um, its component. We were doing this static and dynamic. So we wanted to analyze if behavior had really an effect on the classifier. So we would, in the static experiments, we would place the robot on specific points in the arena and not letting it move, just uh, static there and letting the robot classify. And then for a dynamic experiment, well, that's the full fan, we let the robot move and then try to find the other. And from this, we reconstructed these um, other maps so this is the true positive map for, for ethanol. CPM stands for classifications per minute. It's not actually the number of classification, but the number of cycles that the model detected, but similar thing. And, um, well. <laughs> yeah, time ran out a long time ago, but I'm just okay, looking how many I, slides you have left. No, 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 it will be very, very quick, very quick. Yeah. So I will just show you the, the the slice, this is the false positive for ethanol, so it detected ammonia when it was only ethanol. This is the one for ammonia, false. And this was with two other presents. Of course, we don't have like uh, the ground truth here, but we were able to, well, you know where ethanol is, you know where ammonia is, and well, you can tell that it's slightly biased, but it works. Um, just comparison between moving and static experiments, you can see that um, actually the classifications per minute increase a lot when, when the robot is moving and not st uh, static. So this, this behavior is at, at the same time cleaning the sensors and al al allowing the, the robot to, to perform more classifications. And not only that, but it's more sensitive. Like uh, when the distance is higher, you are able to classify much better that, than, than when it's not moving. And just for the conclusions, <laughs> uh, well, biological inspiration is always good in, in these kind of things. Uh, neural networks are bio biological inspired themselves. Um, this was the first robot being able to uh, locate the uh, other source, uh, being more than one source in the, in the tunnel. Um, it's, it's possible to use these uh, small other peaks in, in the signal to, to classify, which was very interesting, no, not was, wasn't done before. And then um, something about this brain-body dualism, there is, this is a popular idea nowadays that brain is one thing, your body is another. Well, current trend in neuroscience is, is saying the opposite, right? It's saying like, uh, it makes no sense to have a body without a brain and, and your brain is basically a slave of your body in some sense. And I'm going to leave you thinking with this little friend here. This is an acidia, it's some kind of coral. It's a little being in the, in the ocean. And in the larvae fo uh, form, it has a very basic brain. So what they would do is uh, they would uh, navigate the ocean looking for a nice place to stick. And once they stick, they, they will remain there for the rest of the, their life. So what they do is they literally 
uh, digest their brain because they don't need it anymore. Basically, yeah, I, I mean, their philosophy is something like, okay, if I'm not going to do anything, whatever happens around me, I don't need to think about it, so I don't need the brain, and I digest it. That's um, like using Facebook nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. <laughs> So, questions. Do we have questions? One question here. Any more questions? Uh, okay, let's go here. Uh, thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask, what was the size of your training data set? This was uh, some years ago, so it's difficult to, to remember. But to be honest, this classifier, when you, you saw the, the signals that the projection neurons were making, you could clearly see by the naked eye the, this, that they were different, right? So really it was nothing big. We made it ourselves. We put the robot there and, and we used this data as much as we needed. I cannot really tell you now. But uh, at some point before doing this liquid stain machine, we did this classification by hand, just setting some thresholds in the neurons and it would work anyway, so. Cool. Any more questions? Any more questions? I have a question. Actually, when you try to mimic somebody's behavior, an animal's behavior, I guess you can go for representing the actual structure of their brain or just doing a model that acts like them. Uh -huh. And what, what, you know, what was the reason for mimicking the actual you know, model? Well, you know, it was a research project. When yeah. you have this research, <laughs> it's <laughs> like you need to do something, and uh, if yeah. you find the topic interesting, yeah. then uh, you go for it. Well, it, it, it's like that. No, but, no, it, it turned out to be very interesting because it really outperforms on the, or the, all the, the classical uh, other uh, classification mechanisms. So. So, so can your robot find drugs now? <laughs> that, that we, we can talk about this uh, later. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So before the second and third talks, we're going to have pizzas now because they just arrived. So let's get back here in 15 to 20 minutes.
We're we're about to start again, please. Um, So everyone, please come back. We're about to start again. There's some still some spaces at the front if you guys want to sit here. Okay, so I think we can start. So, Rockus, I hope you can introduce yourself. Okay, hi. Uh, we are still waiting maybe for a couple of people, but I will start anyway. Uh, okay, so I'm Rokas from Exacaster, and what we do in Exacaster, we have basically two, two branches of uh, activities. We work with telco clients, and we work, work with retail. And I will talk more or less about telco, because currently we have... Okay, technical issues. Currently we have no screen. <laughs> okay, let's... I think you, your computer just sort of died. No, no, no. No, it's fine, okay. Okay. I think it's hacking the screens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, this is interesting. That's strange. Okay. okay. Uh, so in in uh, telco setting, uh, we have thought of creating a chatbot, but that chatbot we wanted to make like a BI analyst. So this, this are the first baby steps into fully automated business intelligent analyst. Hopefully one day it will be like at the level of junior data scientists. I don't think so, but maybe. Uh, so year ago we got European Union grant and we are working on that grant to create the closest thing possible to junior data analyst. Uh, and I will present our partial results, which we have currently. Uh, but since I want this talk to be like, to give you something to work with when you come back home, as last time I gave you um, also some ideas. This time I want to give you an idea how to build your own chatbot and how to do that really, really fast using open source tools available online. So hopefully after this talk you will run and create your own chatbots, hopefully. Okay, so. I understood what happened. Okay, I will have to use manual control then. Digital tools always disappoint. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pity. Strange. Okay, anyway, I will try. I have like huge lag on the slides. 
Um, is it okay, anyway, hopefully it will work like in this tempo, but anyway. Um, so the basic building blocks, which uh, I will talk about is uh, Rasa. And Rasa is open source tool, which is an actually, they call it Rasa stack. And this open source tool enables you to make the chatbots, which learn using quite sophisticated techniques. I will dig deeper and show you which, what techniques are inside. And I will also show you code samples so you can come back and try that out. And after that, I will talk about outer layer which we built on the top of it, which manages to create SQL queries. So from natural language into SQL queries, and then you can run them on your own system and get actual answers to the actual questions. So if you ask what was the ARPU last month, it will just deliver you one number. So this is the ultimate goal. Okay, so Rasa stack itself contains two parts. It contains Rasa Enlu and Rasa Core. So it's completely open source, you can just take it and use it. And what these two parts do, so Rasa Enlu, it is natural language understanding module which tries to understand intent. So what about are you talking? And it says, okay, you are talking about the weather and you have some sort of the entities. So for example, you want to uh, tell the weather of tomorrow or the tell what was the weather last day or something like that. And Rasa Core decides what next action to take. Let's take a look at the internals of Rasa and this looks a little bit more complicated, but the basic things to note is that Enlu itself, so the first module, it, it's not written there, but it is based on scikit-learn, which has an SVM inside, and Spacey. And I will talk about Spacey in a couple of slides. And the core of it is basically recurrent, no, recurrent neural network, which is built on LSTMs. And after you train this thing, you can get a flow which goes like this. You get a message in, then that message is handled by interpreter, and then you have a loop out there which is basically tracker, which tries to track current state, policy, which decides what to do next, and then action state where it can take an action like to deliver a message to you or to ask something and loop again and again and again. So if you have a question which leads to another action and can take different action than just to message you the answer. Okay. So let's take a look how Rasa training looks like and what data does it need to have. So training data is quite, quite simple. You have some uh, texts and intents. So you say, okay, if I say thank you, that is intent thank you. And you need to prepare this training data. The small talk, small talk data sets can be found everywhere on the internet. So you, can ju you just need to Google them a little bit. Uh, but more complex things, which are your business cases or your uh, chatbot functionality should be uh, transformed into that text intent and entities form. So intent is what to do, entities is which keys to extract and which keys are the most important. On top of that, yeah, never experienced such slow behavior from this, but anyway. So Rasa Enlu, natural language understanding module, gives you probabilities of current intent. So for example, if you say greet, yeah, you say hi, it will give you the confidence level of that action. And that's nice because you can interpret that and you can take an action and actually any action, and we will see in the next slide how Rasa Core then runs it. Yeah, here we go. So Rasa Core itself has not a lot inside, but it has slots, so you can save anything about it, for example, run date, different entities like what you 
were interested in before, like location, for example, I asked what was the weather in Vilnius, I can save that location, I can save that Vilnius and reuse it later on during the next request. And uh, also I have actions, they are down there, but since my screen is not working, I will not be able to scroll down. But in actions, you can write any actions you wish as a Python functions. So these actions can get really sophisticated and you can use all of the available information from the previous things. So you can use all the slots, entities and actions taken before. And finally, what do you, you need to provide for, for RASA is uh, stories. And these stories basically are the sequence of the actions to take. So if she encountered one action, that action immediately follows the different action and so on. So Rasa is able to decide which action to take also probabilistically. And this is especially useful if you are thinking, for example, to build like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, okay, I should figure out an example. Okay, let's say you are in support and you want to build a support chatbot. So in the support environment, if you know the theme you are talking about, then it follows some of the actions on top of that. I mean, if I ask you what problem do you have and you say I have problem with my mobile phone and then I can ask you more questions about relating your mobile phone, not relating other things. So that's why this is necessary and in most use cases, this thing can be generated. At least in our use case, we just could generate that uh, probabilistically. Uh, but as I told in the previous example, in some special use cases, having a special order of actions are important. Okay, so using that, it's quite easy to achieve a small talking functionality. And it turns out that this small talking functionality is especially uh, uh, like liked between people. I mean, when we gave Exa for the first testing round, she had only SQL and no one liked SQL functionality and until we put it small talk. Now everyone says, oh nice, he's so wonderful, this chatbot is so wonderful, it, it knows how to small talk. And yeah, it, kno it also knows how to write SQLs. We thought that SQL is main functionality, but no. So, uh, currently Exa is running in our Mattermost client, but you can to, to put on top any uh, client you wish. So, that's an example of a really simple small talk. But what about SQLs? As I told, I want something which can make a question into SQL query, run that query and deliver an, an answer. Actually, using only RASA functionality it was pretty hard and we should need to have a lot of training data for that. We don't have that training data. And if you look on the internet, you would find a really nice data set called Wiki SQL. And there is also a nice paper called Sequence to SQL, which did that. But they did that only for Wiki uh, data sets. So there is a Wiki tables, with real queries and real answers and using reinforced learning these techniques, they managed to build a model which does exactly that using neural networks. But it does not suit it our use case because we don't have this data yet and we are starting to collect that only now. So we needed to figure out a more simpler way to do that. And we turned into the most simple way we could think of. And uh, as, as everywhere, you should start with the simple things first. And we turned into Spacey. And what Spacey is, it is natural language processing tool, a really powerful thing, which you have to try out if you have never done so. Uh, okay. And this tool has multiple functionalities, but the ones we, are, we were most interesting are tokenization, parts of speech tagging, 
Okay. So but I think the wire is the problem. Not well, like so. it wasn't a problem before, so. <laughs> 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 okay, Could hopefully it will yeah. get up. Um. Yeah, yeah, we have a contact. So that phrase, what was average output last month, gets parsed into this thing here. And that is quite easy to, quite, more, like not quite easy, but easier to uh, interpret. Because now I have actual query and I can identify which SQL parts there are. So average ARPU is the thing which I want to select. Last month is the date and I have this network structure. So what I can do next is to parse this right into SQL. Okay, I need a couple of steps there. And real life queries look much more complicated than that. That's one of the examples. So this is natural language query, could you get me, and so on and so on and so on. But using some simple steps, I can transform this graph like interconnecting those uh, nearby uh, nodes. And quite easily, we can get quite sophisticated functionality. Before jumping into examples, I just want to mention that there are two types of answers we are giving. So in some questions, the graph is the way to go. For others, the table is the way to go. So if you ask for aggregates and if there are enough dates there, we will plot it. Otherwise, we will give a table. So that's what we are doing. And let's jump right into Exademo. Thanks God I made pictures because I don't believe the live thing would work. Uh, okay, so that's an example question. Exa, could you please get me average revenue and total number of outgoing SMS for new and active users? And as you see, it builds an SQL query and delivers a result. Okay, we need to work on the delivery part a little bit. It could be be more beautiful, but since it's the chatbot, I'm using messages. Yeah, and it can handle quite sophisticated queries on top. And you can use different sorts of group eyes, and the nice and neat thing, thing which comes from Rasa itself is that I can work on that query and modify that query using different commands. For example, set date range from 2.17.05 to something like that, and it will repeat the same query with a different date format. So I can modify the query, and we have built a lot of actions, which adds filters, adds group bias, removes some columns, adds some columns, and so on. So you have an interactive SQL builder, which you can run and modify as you go. Uh, as it turns out, with the real people testing this thing, they told it that, okay, that's nice. And it's especially useful for those people who don't know how to write SQL. So if you have like project manager which wants to check on analytics work or just wants a quick number, he does not have to call for analytical team, but he can just go to the uh, chat and ask questions. Okay, so what's next? We are planning to improve that and we will release the chatbot soon for our clients. And hopefully when, we'll, then when they will start using it, we will gather a lot of data and hopefully we will trans transition to neural, and neural networks on that part sometime soon. Uh, and we are also working on more sophisticated things like business intelligence insights, which I will probably talk about next time. And uh, what that part will do, it will try to deliver the most interesting things about your business, but not only outliers, like I talked uh, previous time, but something more sophisticated, I mean business insights. But about that, next time. And now I just want to wish you luck trying out Rasa, and with it you can definitely build a quick and nice chatbot, at least for small talking 
one quick idea, you can build a room booking chatbot or something like that. And it is quite easy. And the nice thing about Rasa, it uses synonyms and everything, and you don't need to think about these things. And if I formulate the sentence in the different order, or I use synonyms, or I make mistakes in my uh, query or my text, uh, Rasa will deal with that. So that's, that's the idea. Okay, any questions? Um, so it's going to be questions. I just have one question bef yeah. before all of you. <laughs> Sorry for um, the slides. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more about the background of Rasa and it's, you know, is it how did it come about and why is it? Uh, well, uh, Rasa itself is open source tool which we just started to use, and uh, there are a lot of such open source tools. But Rasa is like completely open, and it turned out that when we were building SQL functionality and more sophisticated things on the top, that we actually need to modify a code a little bit. So it's always good to have an open source tool which you can dig in and modify. And the uh, main idea of Rasa is quite simple when you get into it. So Great. just, mm -hmm. you have to try that out. Cool, so questions, one question here, one there, okay. Actually, my question is, how you came up with a name uh, for this Exa? platform? <laughs> Exa? Exacaster? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, because every time you say it sounds like Rasa, uh, like uh, it starts with R, so uh, uh, I, I thought there was some relation or... No, no, no. Rasa is uh, the name we don't know. I mean, I, I have no idea where Rasa came from. <laughs> I know where Exa came from. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so one more question here. Uh, is Rasa only for English? How well does it do with other languages? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, now it supports like seven languages or something like that. Uh, now we are working on adding Lithuanian language there also. So if, if we will manage, I will let you know. Cool. cool. Any more questions? Um, nope. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank okay. you. So next up. Um, okay. Okay, hey everyone. Uh, I'm Vladimir from the company Sendence. So first greetings to everyone who came here and greetings to anyone watching this live stream, especially to my colleagues in Antwerp. So uh, a few words about who we are and what we do. As a company, we have a business to business oriented model and we deliver contextual intelligence about the user basis of the companies we're selling our product to. And uh, this comes in a few steps. First about what is contextual intelligence? So here you can see a pyramid. I wish to stress out that the pyramid is not our business model. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, the important part about the pyramids is that first, we built a timeline of user events. We uh, provide a mobile SDK that the customers and users, uh, the customers integrate our model SDK into the, their apps, and with full consent of the users, it starts gathering their accelerometer, gyroscope, and GPS data. We use this GPS data to define a layer of so-called events. Basically, events are GPS and accelerometer data processed through a sequence of machine learning models which tell what the user is doing. 
Is he in some kind of transport, maybe a public transport, maybe he's biking, maybe he's walking to work? If he's walking or biking, we trace the waypoints, we find the most likely route, even given the inaccuracies of the GPS data. If he's driving or in a car, we can tell if he's a driver or a passenger just by looking at his accelerometer data. So lots of complicated models come at this stage. Now using this stage, we take it one step further and we give some intelligence on why the user is doing these things. So maybe he is uh, at school because he's a student there. Maybe he works there, he, he's a teacher. Maybe someone's go at school dropping out the kids because, well, in five minutes you probably can do that. The next level of contextual intelligence is behavior profiles which tell who the user is based on his daily patterns. This means that if user likes to go to sports, well, of course, he's sportive and athletic. If uh, he goes into lots of recreational places with other users, maybe he's very social. All these kinds of information gets captured and presented to our customers as information about the client. But today I'm gonna talk about a very important part of this pipeline which does not fit into the pyramid. And the part that does not fit into the pyramid is predicting what the user is going to do next. So this is kind of interesting. Because uh, unlike in uh, lots of machine learning models which are in their nature descriptive, which just give you some additional information about something that is. It's a completely predictive model. We're trying to make guesses about the future. Okay, the user has been home today, then he went to sports. What are the chances he's going to go shopping today? And uh, this may look familiar to all the science fiction geeks in the audience. I'm gonna talk about this a bit later, but the problem of next event prediction is formulated in a quite simple way. We have a so-called timeline of users' past events. This includes the timestamps of these events. This includes the location GPS fixes. This includes the results of all the models in the pipeline that happened before this, which identify which specific venue the user was at, which identify is he walking, is he running, is uh, he a driver or a passenger, etc. Uh, after all these models, we arrive at a timeline which describes in uh, quite a lot of detail what the user has been doing. And what we need to predict at this moment is what's he going to do next. So first, it's the type of event he's going to do next, like shopping, walking home, being home, sleeping, whatever. The other thing is the start time of the next event. We don't only want to predict what the user is going to do next, we want to know when is he going to do this. And the other thing is how long is he going to do something. So if he goes to a shop, how many minutes is he going to spend there? So the science fiction reference was because uh, probably some of you have read Isaac Sazimov's uh, series Foundation where essentially the premise was that it's possible to scientifically predict uh, the behavior of large groups of people far into the future. Well, uh, the premise also said that it's impossible to predict an individual user's behavior, but if you give a few geeks some time and some time on the Amazon double instance, well, weird things can happen. <laughs> so. The challenge that is constructing in such a model is that first, the model is predictive. Life is random. I cannot say if anyone gets a flat tire on his way to work. And it mostly relies on people sticking to some routines. Uh, the other problem, which is more internal, is that the accuracy is bound by anything that's happened further up in the pipeline. So if the venues the user go to are identified incorrectly, well, the garbage in, garbage out principle still stands and this would affect the accuracy of the next event prediction model. The technical challenge is, is that every human person is different, but no one can, well, maybe Google can, but we definitely cannot afford training an individual model for each one of our users, uh, each one of our end users. This is too much. 
So uh, I will run you through our vision on the model with the few steps that are basically known to anyone who works as a data scientist, and these are feature engineering, this is the model, and this is the evaluation of the results. So let's start with the feature engineering. Uh, I just printed out a little JSON, but uh, it essentially shows a little glimpse of what an event in our internal structure looks like. This is after lots of uh, different machine learning models have already taken place. So we can see it's a stationary event taking place in the city of Antwerp at some specific longitude and latitude. The, our model detected that this place is a user's home. We know uh, how long has he been there. Uh, we know that the type of the place is just a residential building and we cannot say anymore. And for transport events, the features are a little bit different. Now, the first step of what we do with these events is because we have quite a huge amount of possible types of these events, like uh, lots of different types of venues, lots of uh, additional information on the transport modes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have to reduce the number of possible event types to a very manageable list. Now it's 20 events, and this captures most of the things people usually do. So there are some very specific things, for example, like hotel, but we can't capture that. We threw out everything we cannot capture. So this is a, a reasonable list, and we expect that the model would give us what the user is going to do next as according to this list. Then uh, we calculate a few additional features and the most important ones that are needed for our model are distances. So what really affects the probabilities of the next event is the distances to a few particular important places, like a distance to a user's home. Imagine that somebody's like 70 kilometers from home, is he going to go to a grocery shopping there? Eh, probably not. And if he's very far from his car, there's pretty much no way he's gonna drive unless somebody picks him up. <laughs> okay, now uh, let's turn all these things into feature vectors that we actually use for our model. So the first feature vector that comes as one of the inputs of the model is a sequence feature vector. A sequence feature vector has the event type with one hot encoding then comes the one hot encoded duration. This means that uh, it has zeros everywhere except the position at which the one hot event encoded event type occurs. The duration is logarithmized to make the errors pretty much the same on all scales and it's normalized. Then come the time features. We use a uh, time of day representation with basically in two dimensions, you just imagine a clock we're taking a number from zero to one that represents the progress from like midnight to next midnight. And we multiply it by two pi and take the sine and cosine of these things. This is done in order to make the, uh, the feature that represents the time very close, whether it's 2359 or 0000. zero, zero, zero. We also have another number for week progress and this basically goes from zero to one as the week goes from Monday night to Sunday night. The distances to home, work and car are also normalized between zero and one and squeezed there with a logistic function. The idea behind squeezing with a logistic function is that it has the approximate meaning of whether something is within walking distance. So if something is like within a kilometer or so, the distance feature is going to be close to one. If something is not within walking distance, it's going to be close to one. And at around like kilometer to 2.5 kilometers, it is between. It's maybe within walking distance, maybe not, depends on the person. The other input of the model is the knowledge of how the user's been behaving so far. Was he a good guy or not? No, but actually this is just a matrix that represents the event counts. Uh, event counts are calculated at a certain hour of day, at a certain day of week. So this like 24.7, 
uh, 24 times seven times number of event types numbers that are just essentially a bin histogram of the whole user history. So for example, if at Tuesday at 4 p.m. the user went shopping two times and went to sports two times, there's gonna be 0.5 near the shopping, 0.5 near the sports. And this whole histogram is centered on the current time. So if we're trying to make a prediction and we know that the current time is, for example, 4 p.m., then we have a vector that goes at 4 p.m., at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., so the first vector in this matrix is always calculated at current time. And now comes the main dish of this presentation. It's the model itself. Uh, this may look moderately scary, but I'll go through it in a second. So the first with the sequence vectors, this was the first vectors that I've shown you, they go to the left side. We run them through a um, time distributed embedding layer. This means that basically it's a neural network layer that gets applied to all the event vectors in, this, uh, in the whole sequence. But it's the same weights, it's the same biases, same kernels, everything is the same. This thing goes into a recurrent neural network. We've uh, been through a lot of architectures. It's gonna be at the end of presentation where I give some observations about which ones works best, which one doesn't. And the best results are achieved with three layers of gated recurrent units. The histogram inputs goes into a whole different story. And this is a 1D convolution. So we basically have some filters and we convolve the um, tensor along the event type dimensions. This could be written in a different way uh, with time distributed layers just as well, but the convolution part is, was a bit easier to write and code. So basically it tries for each event type to make some numbers and it tries to learn some filters about how far in the future should we look for a specific event type and well basically we try to learn these filters. The outputs of the recurrent neural net and of the convolutional neural net are concatenated. Then they're split into a number of uh, dense layers. One final dense layer goes into the softmax in order to do classification of the next event type. So it outputs a vector with uh, basically class probabilities for every event type. The other one gives a vector of possible durations of the next event. This is also a vector because uh, the durations depend on the possible event type. So if the model would predict that the user goes home with a certain probability, he'll probably spend a lot of hours at home. People usually sleep there, but no one stays in a shop for 12 hours straight. I'm sorry, shopping fans, I cannot believe it. Uh, the last part is the previous duration, and this just means that it should predict the duration of the ongoing event as well, because this thing has to happen in complete real time. This means that even when my current event, which we would be giving a talk of this meetup, is not finished, the model should tell where the next event, which would probably be a transport car or a stationary beers or something. Uh, so it should predict when the next event should start. So it should predict how long is my current event gonna take. Now, how do we train this network? We pick a random timeline from all the data that's available to us. We select a completely random event in the timeline as our target. Uh, not completely random, it should have some sufficient history, but more or less it's random. Next thing is to randomize the duration of its previous event. We're considering that the model is now at this time point and it does not know how long this event is gonna take. So this is also something we need to learn, uh, we, we need to know from the model. Then uh, we run this thing through the forward pass and calculate the losses. For the event type, it's weighted categorical cross entropy. It should be weighted because some events are inherently more rare. Everyone goes home every day, not everyone goes to sports every day, so, and you really should. And, <laughs> and definitely you're not spending every day in a hotel. So this has to be class balanced. 
And for the duration loss, we use uh, must means square error, and must means that only the duration that corresponds to the ground truth contributes to the loss. So if the real event is, for example, a stationary shop, that we do not penalize the model for predicting that if, if it would be stationary work, then yeah, we could penalize it for wrong predictions, but it was really stationary shop. So we have to mask this final vector. Now, at this point, we have some accuracy results on the test set. So apparently, everyone likes to think he's totally unpredictable, but in 70.5% of the cases, we can tell what you're gonna do next. We can tell when you're gonna do this thing, with a mean error of 21 minutes and median error of 6.4 minutes. So half of the time we're within six minutes of the real answer. For the next debate duration, it's a bit more complicated, but it's much further in the future. Should we stop here? Uh, definitely not. The next improvement would be a so-called beam search. And the beam search means that we predict the next event, we append it to the timeline as if it really happened and we try to look further into the future. This generates a number of beams. This means that if we take like the most likely candidate after being home is car, the second most likely candidate is walking, okay, let's append car to the end and see what the next possible most likely events are. Let's append walking to the home event and let's try it again. So when we predict a bit further into the future, we're not just selecting the most likely next event, we're selecting the most likely beam. And this means that even if the first event in the beam may have a slightly lower uh, confidence, if the whole beam has a higher confidence, and we could just obtain the beam confidence by multiplying all the event confidences, then it's likely that this sequence of events is gonna happen. And this is kind of interesting already because it's already a few events in the future. This apparently also improves the accuracy of the model. After some post-processing steps, we just check the beams for some uh, very apparent logical mistakes. They really don't happen a lot, so it's just a few cases per timeline. But, well, if a model predicts that you're going to go shopping at 3 a.m., that's most likely not the case. I'm telling you, it doesn't usually do that, but the rules are there for safety. So we're adjusting the confidences a bit. And on this step, we squeezed out another percent and shoved off a few minutes or seconds from the next event durations. Okay, so there are some very nice observations that were made in making this model that could help you in creating your own models. Is first, uh, let's rank the models that we tried. So the most important part of this whole system is the recurrent neural network. We tried quite a bit of architectures there the one that performed the best was a multi-layer GRU. Next one was deep nested LSTM. It's a very recent paper, but, but this basically says that there's an LSTM inside of LSTM. There's a link here, I really recommend to read it. Uh, for the authors, the, they're claiming that the accuracy outperforms everything, but in our case, still wouldn't be the deep GRUs. Then come the LSTM single layer, nested LSTM single layer, GRU, and the worst offender was the deep LSTM model. Uh, well, as can anyone say, everything depends on your data, everything depends on your model. There's no single best model. So the histogram branch that comes as the second input to the model and gives a model some prior to make uh, guesses with, uh, improved the total accuracy by uh, around 10%. This is additive, not, multiplica not multiplicative, so it was like 60% with only the RNNs. Distant features add a few more percents. And even with the amount of data we have, because we can set any event as the target, we have lots of users, every one of these users has lots of event, still for some reason, dropout regularization that we applied bef uh, between some layers uh, re added like 2% of accuracy to the results. So, it, this is a thing to think about. Even if you don't think your network is overfeeding, you should try drop out. Maybe it will help. 
The last thing I'm gonna tell is how this thing works in production. So this is the data engineering slide. I'm not a very big specialist in this, but we have a master data set that uh, the data is extracted from there using uh, Apache Storm topologies that write messages into a Kafka topic. Uh, the event prediction microservice that's built uh, basically as a Docker container and has Python code running with uh, TensorFlow and Keras as the neural network backend, reads messages from the timelines topic, processes them, predicts the next beams, and writes it into the results topic. If it encounters errors, which I hope it doesn't, it writes them into the error topic. This comes back to the master data set. So this would be pretty much all I wanted to tell you, and I really wish you good luck in building your own models based on RNNs. Great, so who has questions? One up there. I guess the question was, what are you using? Yeah, okay, so we're not using them in any way except to improve our models. The question is what our customers are using them for. And the answer is at the moment, it's mostly uh, health coaching like a very simple use case would be to remind people to take their medications before they get into the car and crash it or something uh, happens with older people. Uh, this would be with insurance because uh, we have a system for uh, evaluating the legality and the driving quality of uh, drivers over there. You probably think it's uh, very related to pushing contextualized advertisement there, but it's not really the case because nobody wants to give up his privacy to just get some discounts on a hamburger. So it's mostly about uh, health, lifestyle, uh, coaching, uh, these kinds of things. Surveillance? <laughs> uh, no, not really. Uh, in, <laughs> uh, in GDPR terms, we're a data processor. We don't own the data. We do not even know who our users really are. It's all anonymized. So maybe if I'm tracking you, I don't know it's you. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, boop, 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 boop. One question here. No, 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 just, uh, just, uh, just, just, I'll give you the mic so the audience can hear. Um, is anything similar to moon eclipses predictions like? To moon eclipses? No. Yeah, I, I just want to compare the systems, like how it works. Uh, it's a bit simpler with moon eclipses. We really know when they happen. I, okay, my model is pretty good at this, but I doubt it can always say we're going to go next. So, <laughs> yeah, moon eclipses are very deterministic, and what's very, very unfortunate for the whole of our systems, but apparently people have free will. Do you use it in your own like work to predict like when you'll come to work? <laughs> uh, uh, I could do that, but a better predictor of when I come to work would be an alarm clock in this case. <laughs> do, do other people use it in your company? You're like... Uh, no. <laughs> or do you use it, yeah. you just don't know that you're using it? <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, we're not very interested in uh, giving each other life advice within the company, <laughs> so <laughs> it's something, we're a business-to-business -business company, we're trying to create value for our customers. And, and the company we're mostly interested in making more fun models. <laughs> Any more last questions? One here? Okay. Yep. Hello. Yeah. How much computing power did it to, took to train the model, and how long did it took? Uh, really not much. So uh, at its peak, the model is at around 700,000 parameters, and it takes about uh, two days to train it on a, a AWS P2 GPU instance. So it's uh, quite reasonable. Uh, it, 
it's not really comparable to uh, some models using computer vision, like the well-known ResNet, etc., where the number of free parameters are measured in tens of millions. Here it's below a million. Any more questions? Well, great. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. Thank you. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, please take your trash out when you come out, if you can. And I'll see you here in a month, I hope.